Let's, uh, let's bow before him before we dig into God's word today. Father, oh, what a privilege we have. To be in your presence with your people, singing your praise, hearing your voice. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, for opening the way to access the Father through your, through your blood. Help us today to enjoy your presence, to just take a deep breath and rest and allow you to restore our souls. Make us this morning to lie down in green pastures by cool waters. Lord, restore our souls today with the nourishing water of your word. Refresh us in you, we ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. We're Daniel chapter 9, if you want to turn there. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel was a man of prayer. Daniel was a man who knew his God. And his prayers shaped his character. He feared God more than he feared kings or lions. In fact, when he knew he would be thrown to the lions, he still was able to find things to be thankful for. He prayed three times a day, not because he had to, but because he had to. Daniel can teach us much about prayer. In chapter 2, we see Daniel encouraging his friends to join him in prayer, seeking mercy from the God of heaven. Chapter 6, we see him devoted to prayer, praying three times a day, so faithfully, so consistently, that his enemies could set their clocks by it. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we could actually hear him pray? It's one thing to have, you, have someone tell you how important it is to pray. It's another thing altogether to just listen to them pray, right? In Daniel chapter 9, we get in on Daniel's private prayer life. We get to hear him pray. We get to taste his emotion, his intensity, his passion, his very heart in prayer, we get a glimpse of his theology in action. Not just what he says he believes, but his worldview, the truths that shape how he actually thinks and feels and walks and talks and responds, responds in real life scenarios and situations. We see his tenderness, we see his sensitivity, his vulnerability, we see his dependency, his neediness, his desperation, his longings. I don't know about you, but I want to learn how to pray from Daniel. So I want to camp out here in Daniel chapter 9 for a bit. I want to soak up whatever we can, listen in to his praying, to be shaped in our thinking, our feeling, to grow in our intimacy with the Father. And I would encourage you as we work through this prayer together over the coming weeks, to take it home with you. It's printed in your Bible, Daniel chapter 9. Take that home with you. Use it as a template for your prayers. There are, of course, some things that are specific to Daniel's time, Daniel's circumstances, but, but our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So today I want to look just at the purpose of prayer or the pursuit of prayer. What are we after in prayer? 
What do we desire? Why do we pray? Or to turn the question around, why don't we pray? Anybody in that? You don't need to raise your hand. Uh, why am I so often prayerless? I think that often I don't pray because I misunderstand or forget what prayer is pursuing. You see, I, I pray when I have a need. I pray when the problem is bigger than me and I can't fix the situation. I pray because God is able, God is good, and He invites me to ask Him for help in my time of need. Now that's all true. That is a, a valid, legitimate motive for prayers. But if, if that is my main pursuit in prayer, if it's when I have a need that I can't handle, when I'm not aware of any need bigger than me, I won't pray. So that can't be the main pursuit of prayer, my needs. Circumstances do drive us to pray. Daniel's circumstances drove him to pray. He was an Israelite in captivity in a foreign land. His people were displaced from their homeland. His city, the temple of his God, lay in ruins. He was reading the prophecy of Jeremiah that God had decreed 70 years desolation for Jerusalem. And Daniel became aware of the fact that those 70 years must be close to their completion. He saw a need. He went to God in prayer. But we also know from chapter 6 that Daniel was in a habit of prayer. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. That was his consistent rhythm of life. Not just when things were bad and he saw a need. No doubt Daniel had bad days when all seemed to be against him, when he was acutely aware of his own need, when he felt he might be, so to speak, thrown to the lions. But Daniel also had good days when he sensed the smile of God. When he was being who he was created to be. When all seemed right with the world. And even on those good days, he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. What was it that Daniel was pursuing in prayer that caused such consistency in prayer? Now maybe you're more disciplined than I am and... Maybe you use lists. Maybe you keep a list of people and things to pray for. Family, friends, finances, missionaries, the lost, our country, our leaders, our church. And you go through the list and you're disciplined and you do that every day. That's great. Those are all good things to pray for. Lists can be helpful. Lists can also be just things to check off. Making us feel like, well, I've, I've done my duty for today. I've taken my list and I've passed it on to the Lord. I've reminded Him of what He needs to do today. Is that the primary pursuit of prayer? What about meals? Y'all pray before you eat? I, I was raised to think that if you ate unblessed, unsanctified food, you'd end up with a stomach ache or worse. Like, don't. It's like, put that fork down, boy, until we pray and thank God for this. Or so my, my brother actually taught me uh, there, there is a biblical prayer for that scenario when you're halfway through your meal and you, you realize, I, I totally forgot to thank the Lord for this. Uh, it's one of the Psalms. I forget which one. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. <laughs> Bless His holy name. And the meals are a good three times a day reminder to be thankful for all the good things God gives us. And there are spontaneous times of thankfulness too when... I'm hiking in the mountain. I see a spectacular view. My heart just overflows with gratitude, with thankfulness to the one who spoke it all into existence. When we receive good things from God, we ought to thank him. 
But again, is that, is that the primary pursuit of prayer? Back in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, you can turn there if you'd like, keep your thumb in Daniel chapter 9, but 2 Chronicles 6, when King Solomon built the temple for the Lord in Jerusalem, he acknowledged in his prayer of dedication, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 18, remember, he, this has been many years in planning, David set this thing up for him, wanted to build a temple for the Lord, to honor the Lord. Solomon carried it out. The building project is now complete and Solomon gathers the people to, to dedicate the temple to the Lord, to pray, to lead the people in prayer. And he says this, 2 Chronicles 6 verse 18, But will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you, that your eyes may be open day and night toward this house, the place where you have promised to set your name, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place and listen to the pleas of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. And listen from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Solomon was the wisest man on earth. He understood God cannot be contained by a building. He also understood our wayward hearts. He anticipated that God's people would not remain faithful to their God. So down in verse six, uh, 36 of 2 Chronicles 6, he prays this. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near, sound like... Babylon? Sound like Daniel? Sound like captivity? It's exactly what happened. If they sin against you and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity saying, we have sinned. And have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart. In the land of their captivity to which they were carried captive. And pray toward their land which you gave to their fathers. The city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name. Then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Their prayer and their pleas. And maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. You. In the next chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, Yahweh answers Solomon's prayer. He says, here's this house I've built. This is likely what's going to happen. Would you listen to your people? Would you be a forgiving God? 2 Chronicles 7 verse 12, Then Yahweh appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I've heard your prayer. And I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. God answers Solomon's prayer. It says, He's praying to dedicate this building, this structure, this temple in Jerusalem that he has made. 
He says, yes, I will keep my attention focused on Jerusalem. But the Lord goes on to warn. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 19. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you. And this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and a byword among the peoples. And at this house, which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, Why has Yahweh done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned Yahweh, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this disaster on them. God warns up front against unfaithfulness to him. He warns us not to abandon Yahweh our God. He warns us not to lay hold of other gods and worship and serve them. Our God is a jealous God. Do not turn aside from His commands. The first of which is, I am Yahweh your God. You shall have no other gods before me. God's invitation here in 2 Chronicles, is if my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. In humility, turn away from the other gods and seek my face. Look with me at Daniel's pursuit in his prayer in Daniel chapter 9. Verse 3. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to Yahweh my God and made confession, saying, Daniel turned his face to the Lord God. Other translations read, I set my face unto, or I gave my attention to. Daniel gave God his face. His undivided attention. He wasn't looking at his phone, messaging Azariah, scrolling through his social media feed. He, he didn't have one earbud in. Oh yeah, I'm listening, Lord. He set all his notifications to do not disturb. He gave God his face. Full attention. We live such distracted lives, don't we? How often do we ever give anyone our undistracted, undivided attention for any period of time? I was taught it was rude to interrupt another person who was talking or to barge into a, a conversation uninvited. But, but we allow the buzzing in our pocket to interrupt the person in the room. What we are saying is that the notification I received is, is more important and more urgent than you are. And I will allow it to interrupt my conversation with you. <coughs> Now, there, there may be times when that is true. That notification might be more important than the person you're talking to right then. That's, that's real life. But is there anyone or anything more important than the Lord our God? Our God is a jealous God. He wants our undivided, undistracted attention. Myriad other gods are competing for our attention. He wants our face. Daniel says, I turn my face to the Lord God, seeking Him. Daniel wasn't seeking God's gifts, what God could do for him. He wasn't seeking answers. He wasn't seeking wisdom. He wasn't seeking 
guidance. He was seeking God. He does have requests that he brings, but his primary pursuit is not the gifts, but the giver. He wants God. Period. He is pursuing the face of God. Psalm 27 one thing I have asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. <clears throat> Put down your lists. Set aside your needs. Seek Him for Him. This is the primary pursuit of prayer. Seek His face. Seek Him just to know Him. Moses desired to see the face of God in Exodus Chapter 33, verse 18, Moses said, Please, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. Moses desperately desired to see the face of God, and he was denied. God said, no. But listen to this in John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He, Jesus, has made Him known. In Jesus... Because of the gospel, you and I, we now have the awesome privilege of being in the presence of Almighty God, of seeing the face of God. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. <coughs> we can look through the pages of Scripture at the face of Jesus, and we are looking into the face of God. God graciously has granted us, you and I, access to see His face today. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. <clears throat> he reconciled us to God in one body through the cross. Through Him we have access in one spirit to the Father. Access by the blood of Jesus through the Spirit to the Father. Seek Him. Not for His gifts, but for Him. Here's my challenge to you, to me, to us. Let's set aside time this week, maybe just 10 or 15 minutes, Eliminate as many distractions as possible and give God your face. Seek Him for Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. We are so easily distracted. Forgive us for giving our attention to so many things. when one thing is necessary. Just sit at your feet. 
Martha, busy, distracted, serving. Mary, she's chosen the better part to sit at the feet of the Lord. Lord, help us to to carve out space in our busy lives and schedules and the demands that are on us. Help us to be intentional about setting aside time to simply be with you. To be in your presence, to, to lie down in green pastures, to graze next to the cool waters, to have our souls refreshed and restored by time, uninterrupted, undistracted time with you. God, show us what that even looks like. Let us be led and guided by your word, by the truth of your word. We know Daniel had his Bible open, his scrolls open to Jeremiah when he sought your face. Lord, may our thinking, may our, pers our pursuit of you be shaped by your word, shaped ultimately by the good news that the Son of God became human, took on flesh to make you known, was crucified on a cross to bear my sins so that I could be forgiven and stand clean and washed and made new by the blood of Jesus in your presence, accepted. So that I can seek your face unhindered. God, give us a desire to be with you. The things of this world, the gods of this world, are so alluring and lead our hearts so quickly astray. Help us to see you for who you really are. To be overwhelmed with a desperate desire to have more and more and more of you. You are the only thing that the only one that will truly satisfy our souls. So you are what you created us for. So help us to fix our eyes on you. Fix our eyes on Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for making a way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I invite some of the men to come to prepare to serve communion, bread and juice, those reminders that Jesus gave us to, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. This is, this is one of those times set aside in the week to say, let's, let's let distractions go, let's let other things go, let's fix our eyes. We've got tangible, physical reminders that the immortal, invisible, God of eternity who spoke everything into existence took on tangible, tasteable, touchable flesh so that he could be nailed to a cross and die in my place. Take the punishment, the wrath of Almighty God that I deserve so that I could enjoy today unhindered, reconciled fellowship with the Father. If you're a believer in Jesus, as we serve you, as you hold bread and juice in your hand, reflect on, on the relationship you now enjoy, the blood-bought access you have to the Father, 
reflect on what it cost. Worship, allow your heart to just overflow and worship to him today. another, nothing we could contribute. He did it all. We have access by faith, trusting in Him, into this grace in which we stand. It's not deserved. It's not earned. We couldn't do anything to merit it. It's a gift. We have access in this grace and we can enjoy the unleashed outpour, downpour of God's grace and kindness towards sinners like us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for paying my price. Thank you for the good news, the gift that whoever believes in you will not perish but will have eternal life. And eternal life is knowing the Father and knowing Jesus Christ His Son, enjoying relationship, intimacy with you. Thank you that we can enjoy that eternal life right here, right now. That we can step into the grace of relationship with you. Enjoy your unmerited favor just heaped upon heaped upon our heads. Thank you for making your face shine upon us and being gracious to us. Jesus, we understood what it cost you. 
this privilege we now enjoy and we want to worship you and say thank you. His body broken for you. Take and eat. His blood poured out for you. Drink. 